What do you think of when you see these two people? Sure, they're both fat, white, mediocre fathers, but I want you to look deeper than that. You ready? Both of them drink beer, and more specifically, American beer. Pawtucket Patriot, American beer. Duff, at least I think so, American beer. These shows were created at a time when it was a given that the most popular beer in America would be made in America, and the jobs that that popular beer brought would be American jobs. This is in stark contrast to recent headlines that Modelo, a Mexican beer brand, has taken the number one spot as the most popular beer among Americans, with Corona, another beer brewed in Mexico, right behind it. But there was a point when four of the top beers in America were not only brewed in America, but in the same city. So if so many popular beer brands were concentrated in one place, how did so many of them fall within just a few decades? And on top of that, how did US industry change so much in such a short amount of time? Well, in order for me to tell you that story, we'll have to tell the story of the city of Milwaukee. Milwaukee, Wisconsin is a Midwestern city situated on the coast of Lake Michigan, about an hour and a half north of Chicago, Illinois. People first started settling Milwaukee in mass droves in the 1850s as a result of the potato famine in Europe. And many people know about how the potato famine in the 1800s affected Ireland, killing over 1 million people and creating over 2 million refugees, but little is talked about how it affected Germany. 42,000 Germans are estimated to have died from those crop failures in Prussia, a former German state. And so because of this blight, many Germans started immigrating to Milwaukee in large waves starting in the 1850s. A significant portion of those people also immigrated from Bavaria, another German state known for Oktoberfest and the dude that made Levi's jeans. Those who immigrated were primarily farmers, artisans, and laborers. And so as these Germans got comfortable and further brought their own culture to the city, Milwaukee would become synonymous with beer. By 1856, there were more than two dozen breweries in Milwaukee, most of them owned and operated by Germans. As early as 1843, pioneer historian James Buck recorded 138 taverns in Milwaukee, an average of one per 40 residents. And that's a lot of bars, but I understand that because what else is there to do in the 1800s but get drunk? Y you can't go to the movies, those don't exist. You can't get on TikTok, that doesn't exist. Video games don't exist. All there is to do is get drunk, ride your horse, go to sleep. And several of these breweries would become known worldwide, with the biggest companies being Schlitz, Pabst, Blatz, and Miller. Try saying that five times fast. Those four Milwaukee-born beer companies would really put the city on the map. And I really want to talk about Schlitz in particular because it really epitomizes the way that the Milwaukee economy has gone. It's also a pretty interesting history. Essentially, this guy August Krug was running a brewery funded by an $800 investment from his dad. Well, anyway, Krug fell down some stairs one day, and then he just died. Two years later, his widow, Anna Maria, remarried Krug's former bookkeeper, Joseph Schlitz. Which is like, come on. If my former employee just remarried my wife after I literally just fell down some stairs and died, I, like, I don't know, like, cremate me at that point. I mean, come on. But anyway, Joseph Schlitz, that shrewd homewrecker, took control of the company and, practicing devout humility, renamed it after himself. The beer company was now called Schlitz. And he did some good business for a while. Schlitz would go on to be the largest beer producer in the U.S. in 1902 and enjoyed that title at several points during the first half of the 20th century, exchanging the title with Anheuser-Busch multiple times during the 1950s. And that's just one example of the early successes of Milwaukee businesses, but the beer industry wasn't the only sector in the city that was growing. The tanneries, the foundries, electrical equipment manufacturing companies were all growing. The 40s and 50s were boom times for Milwaukee's industry, so much so that there weren't enough workers for these factories. The owners of these companies would have to find more employees. But who would they get to solve their employment problem? Who was up to the challenge of building the steam engines, brewing the beer, and working the foundries? And actually, now that you mention it, there was this group of untapped agricultural workers in the southeastern U.S. that they could use to solve their employment problem. We'll just call them, um, we'll call them black people. Prior to World War II, the black population of Milwaukee was pretty small, sitting at just 1,500 people in 1915, for example. 
But during World War II, the small minority began to notify friends and family members in places like Mississippi and Arkansas about the jobs that were now opening up. Those jobs provided wages that were unheard of for blacks in the South. Families of color were actively recruited to come to Milwaukee. And while Milwaukee's manufacturers had discriminated against blacks in the past, the deep need for labor opened up blacks to new opportunities. As black Americans gained their footing in the foundries, tanneries, breweries, and other manufacturing firms in Milwaukee, they were able to move into more important positions. One company that had hired these African Americans, Alice Chalmers, had become the largest single manufacturer of steam engines in the United States. In the process, the company also became one of the city's largest employers. The West Alice Works employed 9,681 workers in 1937, as many as 20,000 during the Second World War, and around 15,000 in the years after the war. But the good times wouldn't last forever for Milwaukee's largest businesses. And so now you need to fully understand how spectacularly Milwaukee's biggest businesses fell off during the second half of the 20th century. So let's start with Schlitz. In the late 20th century, the CEO told his brewers to start cutting costs. They would do so by using corn syrup to replace some of the malted barley used to make the beer, and by swapping cheaper hop pellets for fresh hops. And this change in the quality of ingredients was supposed to be done incrementally, with the thinking being that drinkers wouldn't notice small changes in taste. Unfortunately, as people pointed out, the steps from A to B and from B to C might have been small, but the steps from A to M were really a big leap. The beer was no longer the same and consumers just went to something else. Schlitz would ultimately close shop in 1982. Real estate developers would take the opportunity to turn the old brewery into a 32 acre office park. So what about Alice Chalmers, the employer with 20,000 employees during World War II? Well, through the mid to late 20th century, Alice Chalmers continued to acquire national competitors and it expanded into production of atomic energy and construction equipment. The company reorganized as the Alice Chalmers Corporation in 1971 to incorporate new global subsidiaries. But the company had a hard time remaining competitive, especially as the recession of the 1980s ruined their sales, and other firms like them surpassed them in global markets. And Alice Chalmers really tried to keep from going out of business. They tried selling their different product divisions off, they tried closing plants, laying off workers, but the former giant rapidly went under and would ultimately declare bankruptcy in 1987, closing its last Milwaukee office in 1999. Much of the old West Dallas works were raised or repurposed for retail spaces, offices, and facilities for the Milwaukee Area Technical College. Boom, the real estate developers win again. So with the shuttering of these companies and the mass unemployment that ensued, what were the people of this city to do? A city where the physically strong were once rewarded for casting metals in the foundries, for lifting 160 pound kegs in each hand. In the dark abyss of change, who would come out on top? Where, where would the jobs go and how would the city move on economically? It was the dorks. Instead of the burly man carrying two five-ton steam engines, one in each hand, making the money, it was now the cubicle dork that writes ad copy for Target's back-to-school campaign. He is who makes the bank. These days, the top three largest employers in Milwaukee are in healthcare. Aurora Health is the city's biggest employer at 32,000 employees. Froder Health is number two at 14,000. And Ascension, number three at 10,500. As for companies in other industries, Quad is a marketing solutions company with 7,000 employees in the city. And while several big businesses have been doing well, Milwaukee has been having some issues attracting venture capital funding to start new businesses. The Wisconsin Policy Forum compared Milwaukee with 10 other similarly sized cities and found that Milwaukee attracted less in venture capital funding on a per capita basis than all but two of the cities they examined. And venture capital investing typically supports startup companies with strong growth potential, making that a barometer of entrepreneurial dynamism. In Milwaukee, there's also the issue of those that have been left behind by this new economy. Despite black Americans accounting for just 6% of the state's population, they make up 42% of the state's prison population and are incarcerated at 12 times the rate of whites. 
And there's also Milwaukee's 53206 zip code where the poverty rate is 42%, more than three times the state poverty level at 12%. It's also argued that it's one of the most incarcerated zip codes in the world. While other factors definitely play a role, unemployment and lack of opportunity is central to these incarceration rates. We really can't leave these people behind and need to start preparing them in any way we can to participate in this new economy for the sake of our future and the sake of our country. Many of those old manufacturing companies that were the biggest employers went out of business because they simply couldn't keep up with global competition. But I also want to say that that's just one part of a bigger story. In this story, I wanted to talk about what companies had the most employees in the past and which ones have the most employees now in the city of Milwaukee. It doesn't take into account that while the city of Milwaukee was losing thousands of jobs in the late 20th century, the city's suburban, municipal areas gained more than 100,000 new industrial jobs. And that inspires questions of how that affected the black population deep within the inner city, with the white population fleeing to the suburbs in the late 20th century. But if you want to see a video about that stuff, let me know. Otherwise, I'm making a video about Salt Lake City next. Urgh!